Hi everyone. Welcome to Who Pays for Open Access, the fourth in six events in the Research Without Borders speaker series sponsored by the Scholar Communication Program at the University, Columbia University Libraries. I'm Kathleen Dreyer, the head of the Watson Library of Business and Economics at Columbia University. We have three panelists today, Mike Rosner, Ivy Anderson, and Bettina Gerner. Mike Rosner did his PhD in molecular biology in the laboratory of Professor Sir Ken Murray at the University of Edinburgh. He was managing editor of the Journal of Cell Biology, journal, the Journal of Cell Biology from 1997 to 2007. In 2006, he's, he was promoted to executive director of the Rockefeller University Press. Mr. Rosner received the Spark Innovator Award in 2009 for his efforts to promote data integrity and public access to scholarly re research. Ivy Anderson, sitting on the end here in purple, is the Director of Collection Development and Management at the California Digital Library. Ms. Anderson was the lead for the California Digital Library on making the University of California the first U.S. institution to support the Sponsoring Consortium for Open Access Publishing and Particle Physics, and on concluding an agreement with Springer to make all University of California author articles available as open access under the Springer Open Choice License. Betty Gerner, Bettina Gerner, sitting here in the middle, studied biochemistry and molecular biology and carried out research for her master's thesis at the Max Planck Institute for Biophysical Chemistry in Göttingen, Germany. After her study, she gathered work experience at the Harvard Institutes of Medicine, McKinsey and Company in INSEAD. In October 2008, Ms. Gerner joined Springer as a management trainee working on projects in editorial marketing and e-product management <coughs> sorry, and innovation areas. After showing early interest in open access, she was appointed manager open access in Springer's business development unit. So what we're going to do right now is Mr. Rosner will speak first, give his presentation, then Ms. Anderson, and then Ms. Gerner. Then after they give their presentations, we'll open it up for questions. So. I wanted to read their bios first, get it out of the way. So, um, Mike, take it away. And also, I should say this, of course, I forgot. <laughs> We're videotaping the event today, so when you do ask questions, please use the microphone in the middle. And I think that's everything I wanted to say. Well, thank you for the introduction. Uh, thank you to Catherine. Is Catherine here? Oh, over there. <laughs> thank you to Catherine for the invitation to be here. And thank you all for coming on this beautiful day instead of having your lunch outside. Um, I'm Mike Rosner, the Executive Director of Rockefeller University Press. We publish three biomedical research journals, the Journal of Cell Biology, the Journal of Experimental Medicine, and the Journal of General Physiology. Now, I have two subtitles for this talk today. Uh, the first is practical. And I'll start with some definitions that are relevant to this discussion. And then I'll describe what we've been able to do as a subscription-based publisher to provide public access to the biomedical research articles that we publish. Second subtitle is a bit more provocative. And I'll uh, read from an article that I've been working on that's describing what I think is uh, the most important development in the public access movement over the last few years. Okay, to start with some definitions, and of course, with the definition of open access. Now there's all sorts of colors associated with open access, gold, green, yellow, blue. Um, I happen to be colorblind, and so I have a very difficult time making sense of all those colors. So I'm going to start with the most basic definition, and that is free access of scholarly research articles to the public immediately after publication, as basic as that. Publishers who provide this kind of access can't sell subscriptions, so they recoup their costs through an author pays model, or advertising, or some form of subsidy. And I'll describe uh, more about subsidies later in the talk. Now, I know it's not uh, the focus of this discussion today, um, but there is an element of copyright in the definition of open access. Um, and that's the concept of free reuse of published content by third parties without permission. So in addition to free access, there's supposed to be no barriers to reuse of the content. 
The second definition, public access. I define public access as free access to scholarly research articles to the public at some defined time point after publication. If that time point is zero, you're talking about open access. If that time point is greater than zero, you're talking about delayed public access. I don't use the term delayed open access, that's an oxymoron. Open access means immediate access. Publishers who provide delayed public access recoup their costs by keeping their content under access control for a short period of time to sell subscriptions. So we sell rolling subscriptions. Um, again, in my opinion, there's also a concept of copyright for the definition of public access. Um, and that is the concept of free reuse of published content by third parties without permission from the publisher. Uh, unfortunately, there are not all that many publishers that adhere to that principle. So why do we at Rockefeller University Press support public access to scholarly research articles? Well, first of all, we work for a university that has uh, the mission, Scientia Pro Bono Humani Generis, Science for the Good of Humankind. As the press department of that university, our mission is to disseminate knowledge as broadly as possible. We do this to promote scholarly communication in the advancement of science. And we do this by keeping as little as possible under access control. A second reason why we support, at, why at Rockefeller University we support public access to scholarly research articles is that we feel we have an obligation to the public. The public funds much of the research that we publish. They fund many of the scholars, the salaries of those scholars who carry out peer review on our behalf. And they fund many of the libraries, either directly uh, at state institutions or indirectly through grant overhead uh, that buy our subscriptions. So given our mission and our obligation, uh, why don't we publish open access journals? What's the barrier to open access for our journals? And the basic answer is that they're selective journals. By that I mean we get a large number of submissions, we carry out stringent peer review, thus we have a high rejection rate, publish a small number of papers, and as a result, the cost per article is very high. Now, I just had our finance director redo this cost uh, evaluation last week. And our cost per article is nearly exactly $10,000. That's per article. That's only for online publication. I pulled out all our printing and distribution costs. I even pulled out the costs of our circulation personnel, who wouldn't exist if we were open access. $10,000 per paper. I do not yet know of any funder willing to pay that much per article. Uh, some examples that we have, uh, the Berkeley Open Access Fund has a limit of $3,000 on it. Uh, the Wellcome Trust, which is, again, funds only a very small portion of what we publish, they have the highest uh, dollar amount that I know of uh, for open access funding, and that is $5,000. Only half of what it costs us to publish our papers. So, of course, you're asking yourselves, why are our costs so high? Well, as I said, uh, we do very stringent peer review. We have a very low acceptance rate. Um, in 2009, across our three journals, we had approximately 5,000 submissions. We published about 500 papers. We only published 10% of what came in. And to efficiently process all of those manuscripts through the peer review process, uh, it takes, uh, takes staff. Uh, we have an editorial staff of 17 people. Our primary costs are staffing costs. We also still believe in high quality production. Uh, I, I know not all people do anymore, uh, but we do. And we have a large production staff, a uh, production staff of 14 people who do copy editing and also work to ensure data integrity. Uh, for example, we have two full-time employees who examine every figure in every accepted manuscript uh, for evidence of image manipulation before publication. That costs money. 
So I, I just want to point out, you know, although the cost for dissemination of information has come down in the internet age, there is still a cost for online dissemination of information. Again, that figure of $10,000 that I gave you is for online only production, does not include printing journals at all. So with all those uh, factors, what is our business model? We release all of our content to the public six months after publication. We've done this since 2001. So we've done it for more than nine years and our revenues increased every year through 2009. We are selling subscriptions to content within the first six months after publication. We sell a rolling six months worth of, of content uh, as a subscription. We do not offer an open access option. And this is a process whereby subscription-based publishers take an extra fee from authors to make their articles open access while still selling subscriptions. And this has become known colloquially as double dipping. Okay, so why don't we offer an open access option? Uh, well, we have both a practical uh, and a moral objection to the open access option. Uh, the practical objection is that we don't believe in providing spotty immediate access to just a subset of our content based on the ability of an author to pay an extra fee. We want to make all of our content available to the public, and we do that after a short delay. And the moral objection is that this option has been hijacked by subscription-based publishers to provide even more revenue for their coffers on top of their subscription revenue, while many, I would say most, have not willingly changed their overall public access policies. They're not releasing the, all of their content at any point. So given the high cost uh, per article of publishing in a, a selective journal, is it possible to publish the selective journal under an open access model? That is to make all the content free immediately. And the answer is yes, um, with subsidies to author payments. And these subsidies can take the form of grants. Uh, one example is the Public Library of Science that got many millions of dollars in grants as startup money. They can take the form of memberships. Uh, both P PLOS and Biomed Central sell memberships to institutions. Uh, these usually come with a reduced art, uh, article charge to the authors of that institution, um, but these seem suspiciously like subscriptions to me. Another way to subsidize uh, a selective open access journal is to sell the news content. Uh, an example of that is the British Medical Journal. They make all of their research content open access and sell subscriptions to the news content. They have a very large news section. I'll use BMJ again as an example. Uh, another way to subsidize is to sell subscriptions to other journals in a stable of journals. So the BMJ group publishes a whole lot of journals. Uh, almost all of them are uh, subscription based. They offer no uh, research content open access and that's subsidizing the open access in their flagship journal to the research papers. And a final way uh, to subsidize author payments is by publishing an archival or high volume open access journal. Um, and a very successful example of that uh, that uh, many people are aware of is PLOS One, which is subsidizing uh, the open access uh, for the selective journals that are published by PLOS. And I'll finish here with one uh, more definition. Uh, I'll define an archival journal. And I'm defining an archival journal as one that applies a lower stringency of peer review. Reviewers at these journals uh, usually uh, ask if the data support the conclusions, but they don't ask whether the work represents an advance in the field. Selective journals apply that second criteria. With this lower stringency, uh, archival journals are able to publish a high percentage of submissions, they can publish a lot of papers, and the cost per article is low. Okay, that's it for the practical part. Um, now I'm gonna read you an excerpt from uh, an article that I've been working on, it's called Updating Realistic Access. 
Um, and it is an update to an article that was published in the Journal of Cell Biology uh, six years ago now that was called Providing Realistic Access. And the subtitle is Universal Public Access Mandates Will Reveal the Value of Biomedical Research Journals. The most important development in the past six years in the public access movement has been the mandates from funding agencies and research institutions. The most prominent of these is the NIH mandate, which requires that the published results of NIH-funded research be made accessible to the public within a year of publication. The Federal Research Public Access Act, which has been introduced to the U.S. Congress, seeks to extend this mandate to several other federal funding agencies. Globally, numerous other governmental and private funding agencies have instituted similar policies, or stricter ones, which require release to the public within six months. Research institutions have also begun mandating such public access through their own repositories. The institutions, however, must also respect the need for publishers to recoup their costs by providing a short embargo, we have shown that six months is reasonable, before releasing content to the public. All biomedical research funders and institutions should mandate public release of content six months after publication. When all biomedical research publications are available to the public, an economic layer will be added to the definition of selective versus archival journals. Selective journals publish content that can be sold in the first six months after publication. Archival journals publish content that few people are willing to buy during the first six months after publication and they have to recoup their costs through an author pays model or some other non-subscription model. Currently, librarians are paying for archival content that is kept perpetually under access control. If all biomedical research articles were free to the public after six months, and librarians had the ability to choose individual journals at reasonable prices, they would only subscribe to those journals with quality content to which their users demanded access during the first six months post-publication. But is there enough value left in selectivity to provide this demand? Has the revolution in searchability negated the utility of selective journals as filters of information? That is, is there still a value to the stringent peer review process used by selective journals? Or should all publications appear in archival journals? As one editor has noted, Selective journals prioritize and streamline information for busy readers and provide a hierarchy, admittedly imperfect, for appointments, promotions, and grant review. There is a value to knowing that the editors and reviewers of a selective journal thought that a particular piece of work was a significant advance in a field. People are still willing to pay for that value and, I believe, will continue to do so for some time. In the words of one observer of the scholarly publishing, publishing industry, charging for information is a clear-cut way to know how valuable it is. For biomedical research journals, I would modify that statement to say, charging for information in only the first six months after publication is a clear-cut way to know how valuable it is. Thanks very much. And now Ms. Anderson. So, I've called my talk um, uh, Transforming the Marketplace Angels and, or Demons, and um, if any of you heard me give a talk at the Spark Forum last summer, this is the same, some of the same ideas and the same content, just um, updated a little bit, um, but it's a similar theme. Um, and the, the theme here is that um, we've tended to pit subscriptions and open access um, against one another, but um, increasingly, um, I personally am interested in finding the sustainability point that keeps um, access uh, as broad as possible and affordability as low as possible. And that may in some cases be open access and in other cases it may not be. So um, a little bit of background and context. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the um, publishing environment and, uh, and the big deal environment. Um, <clears throat> uh, I'm, and I'm going to talk I I specifically about four different initiatives that we've been engaged in at the University of California, um, our support for Scope 3 and our Springer Open Access Pilot, and also um, the Berkeley Research Impact Initiative, which is the publishing fund that Mike uh, referred to before, um, as well as CDL's uh, e-scholarship uh, publishing service and some of what we see as next steps for us.
So I think many of you um, know CDL, but for anyone here who is, who is not uh, familiar with CDL in the University of California, we're um, a 10 campus system, uh, uh, nine research universities and one um, health sciences campus. Um, uh, CDL handles uh, licensing activities and many other coordination uh, activities involving digital initiatives for, on behalf of the full university. So um, we do license most of the system-wide uh, journal content. Um, available at the university. So um, UC faculty are very strong supporters of open access. Of course, that's one can't make a blanket statement. UC is a big tent, and there are many different perspectives. But uh, from a policy perspective, those faculty who engage most closely with the library, serve on our system-wide faculty library committee, are very staunch supporters of open access. They've recently written a letter to the university president asking um, CDL, which uh, is part of the office of the president, um, to work on their behalf to create more open access options to support things like FERPA legislation and so forth. So there's a very strong um, uh, directive from our faculty advisory committee to um, explore open access options and, and create more open access um, uh, availability. Um, one of the founders of PLOS, Michael Eisen, is uh, at Berkeley and um, in the Berkeley lab, and so um, there's a connection there that you can see. But um, even though these faculty um, are uh, very, um, uh, uh, very strong in their support of open access, they also want their lives to work well and easily. And so we also hear from faculty that they don't really want to have to publish somewhere else. You know, don't tell us where to publish. Um, just make it easy for us to publish in the venues that we already want to publish in. Of course, we also hear that faculty don't, always, don't necessarily want to pay article processing fees, so there's a lot of concern about the Im impact on, uh, on their own um, individual budgets or research budgets if they're forced to pay uh, article processing fees. Um, uh, we have a very strong uh, institutional repository at UC uh, in, in our e-scholarship service, um, but it's, it doesn't attract as much content as it might because there's too much overhead in depositing to institutional repositories. Um, many faculty of our faculty want to deposit, but they want it to be easy. They want it to be a byproduct of other things. They don't want to have to do something specific or extra in order to take advantage of those services. The faculty have, have said to us at the CDL um, that the university should, should negotiate on their behalf to produce open access uh, solutions, but they should, be, uh, they should be convenient to us. Research um, also tells us many of the things that Mike was just talking about, that what scholars want from their uh, uh, publishing outlets, um, of course, rigorous peer review, stature and selectivity is, um, is very important to faculty. Um, these, these findings, um, there's nothing new here, but they are validated as they often are any time this subject is studied. Um, this is a recent study at, the, um, uh, at Berkeley Center for the, st for, uh, the Study of Higher Education. <clears throat> called Assessing the Future Landscape of Scholarly Communication, um, and it was uh, it, some in-depth uh, interviews with faculty in a, in a range of disciplines. So um, impact factor journal brand is an important part of that uh, selectivity. Um, one quote from that study, peer-reviewed prestige publications are the coin of the realm in tenure and promotion. Um, and a particularly interesting finding, I think, from this study was that the um, younger uh, authors, uh, younger graduate students, uh, tech-savvy folks, are still um, uh, st still choosing the traditional options. And of course, I think we all know that as well. Those are the folks who are most vulnerable, whose careers need advancement. Their, their career depends on being published in the best outlets. And so that reinforces a very conservative approach to publishing. So that all of that reinforces publishing in the outlets, in the, in the journals that um, are that are already extant and have have prestige and have brand, and that leads us immediately to the um, the large publishers and the big deals. Although not all large publishers, there's some very small publishers that also are prestige publishers. But as we know, many of our journals are um, are published by by um, our colleague mega publishers. Um, and if you, look at, um, if you look at the data over time, and this is a chart that's taken from the Association of Research Libraries. I think many of you are probably familiar with this chart or various iterations of it that have been published over the years. Um, it does show quite clearly that um, it, with the advent of the large, uh, uh, what's called the big deal that, that um, many libraries and consortia now, now participate in, um, 
the serial unit cost has, has really gone down significantly. So um, between, between, say, 2000 and 2006, I think it's the end point of this particular chart, um, serial unit costs declined by 180%. That's significant. Um, the number of serials purchased increased by 50%. That's also significant. So um, even though serials are still at a very high point on that chart, which is the problem for us, the cost is still high relative to um, our budget budget capacity, the, the, um, the, the affordability of that content or the unit cost of that content has gotten, um, uh, has gotten a little bit more favorable. So there is some uh, increased access and, and uh, cost control that we've achieved um, at, through, these, through these deals. So I think the library motivations um, for uh, supporting open access and for negotiating big deals, which are often pitted against one another, are really some of the same motivations. Um, we're, we're trying to do what we can to reduce the overall cost of the scholarly publishing system. In the case of open access, um, we do that to place market pressure on high-priced publishers, and I think that sense of competition has driven down pricing from some of the larger publishers, and also experimenting with more sustainable uh, publishing models and business models. On the big deal side, we're trying to reduce the overall cost by placing market pe pressure on the high-priced publishers through negotiation, through aggregating uh, a spend and, and reducing that, that cost, and, and seeking a more sustainable unit cost. Um, similarly, you know, the desire to maximize information for users, open access clearly does that in, in the sense that it's open, so um, no uh, barriers there. Um, big deals, similarly, you're embracing more content and so uh, conceivably you're expanding access, etc. So in some respects one can see that the drivers here are, are similar and maybe we shouldn't really pit these uh, against one another. Um, the, the one thing that's missing in many of the big deals is that um, third bullet point that Mike had in his slide about um, reuse um, and the ability to reuse content as sort of broad use permissions and use rights. And um, that's where some of, the, um, some of the barriers and some of the um, unhappiness lies in, in uh, some of the uh, commercially licensed content or subscription content. So the premise here is that um, Maybe the traditional publishers, the existing publishers, um, are not our enemies, but that we can sort of turn them into, um, into our better angels uh, by working with them to try and, um, and explore alternative business models. Um, and that transforming those, public, those publications is an appropriate path to experiment with. And that's led to a couple of the experiments that UC is involved with. So even Stuart Schieber at Harvard, who is not a supporter of uh, the kind of hybrid open access uh, model that we've uh, engaged in with, with Springer has argued that um, in order to uh, convert existing publishers to a gold open access model, um, we have to make it possible for a publisher to convert to that model. And that's really the premise of some of our experiments, particularly our experiment with um, Springer and Scope 3. So these are two initiatives that you see engaged in um, early on. One was a support for the Scope 3 project, which I'll talk about in a minute, and the others are a Springer open access pilot. Um, both of these have the goal of experimenting with uh, converting existing journals to an open access model. Um, uh, they're also similar in that they maintain the library's role in the funding and negotiation process. We're not just telling authors, go pay article processing charges. We're trying to mediate that relationship and, and facilitate that arrangement. Um, and they both involve a deposit of final published articles into open access repositories. Um, institutional or otherwise. So scope three um, is, um, and many of you may be well familiar with this, so I won't spend a lot of time on it. Um, it's an initiative based at CERN to convert uh, core high energy physics journals to open access. The idea behind scope three is that one would take the existing uh, expenditures for subscription journals in those fields, and that is a unique field in which much of the publishing is concentrated in a small number of journals. So you take the money that the subscription uh, expenditures that are directed to those journals and migrate them over to um, a, a pooled fund that becomes a funding consortium, thus um, the no notion of a sponsoring consortium for open access. And the consortium itself would manage the publishing and peer review process. It would essentially outsource the publishing process to uh, publishers, but that would be more of a contractual relationship. And the consortium would be uh, would be managing the peer review and managing the uh, the um, uh, distribution of, of articles into those journals. Um, 
this initiative has been uh, gestating for a while and it has not uh, achieved yet the, the critical mass that it needs to actually go forward and become uh, an active project. It is still going forward, however, right um, at this time, they've uh, received about 70% of the, the funding that they believe they need. Um, and um, it's still uh, something that we're interested in supporting as an exploration for uh, various ways of organizing funding and organizing business models. Our open access pilot with Springer was another um, sort of first in the U.S. initiative that UC uh, undertook. Uh, we uh, negotiated this arrangement with Springer in 2008. It's effective uh, for the 2009 and 2010 uh, uh, years of our license, so it's a two-year pilot under which all uh, UC authored articles are published with um, full and immediate open access using Springer's open choice uh, paradigm. Um, this was negotiated as part of our license fee for the journals. We did, there was no increase in our license fee for the journals, so essentially we are paying Springer what we were paying Springer the day before the pilot. Um, we're still paying that same amount or whatever we had negotiated for, the, for that subscription period. So we are not at this time paying any additional author fees for the open access uh, benefit. And I think Bettina will have some things to say about that when she follows my, my talk. Um, um, it's, uh, any UC author is eligible for this, not just the corresponding author. Um, there's some tricks to figuring out um, uh, and making that work, as you'll see in a minute. Um, but it's similar to arrangements that Springer has had with Max Planck, University of Göttingen, the Dutch University Consortium. Um, some of you may have seen um, just yesterday or today that that agreement with Max Planck is no longer in effect. So upon renewal, that relationship is changing. And, and again, I think Bettina will talk a little bit about Springer's evolving views about this model. Um, and finally, the, um, the, the UC published articles are deposited automatically in CDL's e-scholarship repository, so that's a function of the transaction between Springer and, and CDL, that those uh, articles are made available to, for us to, uh, to harvest automatically into, into our repository. Uh, we have a plan to do some uh, assessment uh, of this pilot um, in this year. We haven't really started that formal assessment uh, project yet. We're just uh, gathering ideas for it right now. So uh, the way this works for authors, when a, a, an accepted um, author, submitting author, uh, is paper is accepted, they go through a series of acceptance screens. Um, and on one of those screens, they're invited to select the institution that they're affiliated with um, in order to, at, through a drop-down menu, um, in order to complete the acceptance process. And if they select the right institution, um, they are told that their article will be made available as open access at no cost. So it's a very straightforward uh, process using uh, Springer's online submission system and, and acceptance system. When we announced the pilot, faculty responses at UC were very, very positive. Um, my favorite one is the third one there that uh, says, your experiment is a monumental event that could define a new paradigm that will forever change the scholarly publishing landscape. Uh, well, we'll see. We'll see. It so sounds good. However, the faculty uptake has been not as high as, as that, and we are going to be doing some assessment in this year to figure out why. My suspicion is that this is really a mechanical issue, that it, this, it's the submitting or corresponding author who has to actually implement the open access provision because they're the ones who are presented with those screens and that may not always be a UC author. So there ha is communication that has to happen. Um, I'm guessing that even when that uh, corresponding author is a UC author, they may go through this process quickly and not pay attention. You know, our first, uh, when we first announced this, we did a lot of uh, marketing and publicity, and we have a web page about it on various websites that the libraries manage, including our scholarly communication site for faculty. But I think we all know that awareness of things like that tends to degrade over time. So my guess is that the, the issue here is awareness and not um, an explicit desire by some faculty not to publish their articles in that way, although there could be some of that as well, and so we do want to study, study those things. So some differences between the approach of scope three and the, and the Springer approach. In the case of scope three, the control of the journals does uh, move to the funding consortium and the peer review and editorial functions are really outsourced kind of a, on more of a almost contractual basis. Um, and the Springer arrangement, w the rights remain with, with, um, with the author, but the, the control of the journals remains with the publisher. So it's really changing the funding model, but not, not changing the structure of the relationships in the industry relationships very much. 
again, this notion of transforming existing journals, um, uh, some of the, the, the benefits that we see in experimenting in this direction, it's non-disruptive for authors, it supports their existing uh, reward system, um, it, doesn't, it doesn't invite them to publish in some other outlet than, other than those that they would otherwise be choosing. Um, it, ex it leverages existing relationships and funding streams, so right now we, we hand, hand publishers a pretty big check and we could still hand publishers a pretty big check and that's one financial transaction, so it preserves some of the efficiencies that are inherent in some of the relationships. It seems scalable. We can negotiate that relationship again on behalf of the institution. It can affect a large number of journals at once if, if an arrangement like this um, is affected with a, with a large publisher. It also allows us and, and the library to support authors who lack research funding and therefore would not be likely to have funding that they can draw upon to support article processing fees. Um, so, I, you know, humanities, social sciences, early career authors that don't have a, uh, deep pockets. One thing that we, we do like also about the, uh, the Springer arrangement, and this would be true of Scope 3 as well, is it avoids version proliferation. So um, there's some concern about the multiple versions of articles that are floating around in various repositories and the inability to make the, the published version of record the open version. Um, and the, an arrangement like this um, eliminates that, that confusion or that issue by making the version of record the one that's available. Um, there are certainly many challenges in, in uh, pursuing this model. Obviously, uh, a small number of institutions have done this with Springer, um, but most of the content is still, still subscription-based uh, content. Um, we don't really know how the cost picture is changing um, for Springer, so how can we leverage our expenditures and make sure that we are keeping costs under control? Um, Contraction of the funding base, I think, is a general issue that's of concern for open access, uh, for um, sort of gold open access publishing. Um, uh, there are more readers than there are authors, so um, subscri subscriptions spread the revenue burden across a much wider uh, range of players than um, authorship does, and so there's some contraction that is going to uh, would entail uh, some uh, in some cases significant cost shifting. If one thinks of this as a process whereby more and more of the content would become open access in a given journal, then there's a point at which some libraries will say, "Well, no need to pay for this uh, to to subscribe to this publisher's journals anymore because enough of them are open access." And so there would be some contraction of the funding base through that uh, mechanism. And there are other kinds of subscribers like corporations, um, which are um, a small but not uh, not zero uh, percentage of this, the revenue picture right now. So there's some contraction, potential contraction of revenue that happens if you convert to an author side um, uh, uh, system. And in the, an arrangement like the one we have with Springer where the library is essentially handing money to the publisher uh, in the way that we do currently, there's no obvious role for funding bodies in that particular model. So um, some directions that we've thought about, we, we regard all of this as experimentation and something that's helping us understand the marketplace and the environment and will help us to chart um, our next steps in this whole scholarly communication enterprise. Um, embargoed access is one, um, one possible uh, future for some kinds of journals and that's essentially um, what um, Mike was talking about is public access, um, a short term um, uh, embargoed window of access. Um, and whether that provides sufficient incentives to maintain a subscription base and yet will lead to more open access. Um, Highwire is another example of that where um, many, if uh, not most of the journals on Highwire have open archives after I believe it's a year or so. Um, and that may be a model that works in some fields and not in other fields and that's something that you know, we really need to understand is where can that work and where can't it work. Diversifying the revenue stream in some, in some ways. Um, a combination of institutional funding and article processing fees um, is a way to diversify revenue and that's um, characteristic of things like the arrangements for nucleic acids research, um, Biomed Central, um, et cetera. So um, that might be a direction that we could pursue um, to um, uh, have a certain level of payment through the institution coupled with um, uh, lower article processing fees for, for authors. Um, organizations that don't subsidize would then be subject to a higher fee. We've also thought a little bit about submission fees, and I just want to say something about that. I know that um, there are some organizations that are doing a little bit of study about this right now. 
But one of the, one of the arguments, or some the contention that uh, many in the publishing industry have, um, have asserted is that um, part of the growth in the cost of, of, uh, of journal publication is a result of the growth in journal publication itself. And um, this has been studied by a, a number of folks uh, showing that um, there's been really a quite a, a steady increase over time in the rate of publishing over very long time frames of about 3% um, per year. And if you look at um, between 1980 and 1995, for example, if you look at the growth in uh, research uh, R&D workers, the growth in articles, the growth in journals, they all sort of fall, uh, follow this same trajectory. And so there's just more stuff and more stuff and more stuff every year. Well, so we've thought a little bit about, and, and meanwhile, of course, we hear that the cost of, of peer review and, and the cost of selectivity is very high. And as we see um, increasing growth around the world, we also see that we're, um, we libraries are paying for that submission, that increase in submissions. And so is there a way to use submission fees to diversify revenue streams? Um, there are some fields that do have submission, uh, submission fees. Um, so in this example, this sort of a hypothetical example, um, it pegs the co total cost of the worldwide journal publishing system at $8.9 uh, billion, which um, uh, I've seen figures of $8 billion, some, so, you know, give, or, uh, give or take a billion. Um, that's sort of where, what, what, the, what the current estimates seem to be. Um, articles published worldwide, I've, my, the most recent figure I've seen is 1.5 million. Um, uh, an average rejection rate has been uh, said to be 50%. So if you do the math um, and you assign a hypothetical submission fee of $100 per article, which is not exorbitant, um, that would produce another $270 million under this calculation to the publishing system as a whole. <clears throat> Obviously, more of that would flow to the very selective journals. Um, but it tracks, it tracks reasonably well with the growth in publishing. So it, um, I know many publishers have said the overhead and administrative cost of processing submission fees makes this uh, uh, unattractive and not feasible. And of course, publishers don't, are competing with one another. And so very few publishers will adopt uh, something like this if their competitors are not um, uh, adopting a similar model. But again, it's one way to think about how the revenue stream might not only be um, differentiated, but also scale with the activity that's actually going on. It might, in fact, dissuade some uh, spurious submitters from submitting articles that they know won't get published in a particular outlet, and that would then lower the publisher's cost. So, um, uh, so again, just something that we've been thinking about and trying to model. A couple of other projects that are going on at UC um, that are uh, not aimed at the tr existing journals, but at, at newer journals. Uh, one is the Berkeley Research Impact Initiative, and the other is our um, e-scholarship repository. So the Berkeley Research Impact Initiative is a fund, a special fund that the libraries and the Berkeley Office of Research um, uh, jointly um, have uh, put together to fund article processing fees for uh, Berkeley authors. If research funds are available to the author, then the, fee, the, the fund cannot be used. So it's meant to supplement where research funds are not available. Um, the fund will sponsor up to $3,000 for a full open access journal, a so-called gold OA journal, and <clears throat> up to $1,500 for a hybrid uh, journal. It was an 18-month pilot. I believe it's been renewed, so it's still going on. And the preliminary assessment, and there may actually be an updated assessment, but um, doing some of the math, um, here, 75% um, of the um, articles that were um, requested, uh, for which support was requested, were actually able to be funded through research grants. So the, the fund only had to, um, to sponsor 25% of the requests. The average fee was um, about $1,600. So Berkeley has estimated that their authors uh, publish about 5,000 journals per year. Um, if that's the case, then their total cost for supporting authorship under this model would be $2 million. Their total licensing fees for everything that they license is $4.4 million. That includes resources that, that CDL licenses on their behalf as well as uh, resources they license locally. So you know, their calculus is that this could lower the institutional cost. Whether it lowers the system cost is a very different question, but the focus here is on the cost to the Berkeley Library. That is interesting, but um, many of these publications 
um, have, have had trouble achieving financial viability. So what if we ourselves become the publisher, um, we the libraries, the institutions, and don't rely on third parties that have a different cost structure? Well, this is something that um, is, um, exists that you see in the form of our e-scholarship repository, which has um, reconceptualized itself as more of a publishing platform than a repository. So there's mo more focus now on the publishing uh, uh, service of e-scholarship than, um, than the, the repository function. They support journals, monographs, conference proceedings, working papers, seminar series. These are all things that are published uh, at UC by UC um, faculty or, or, or authors uh, or edited by UC faculty or authors. Um, they also support, or I should say the service also supports traditional repository um, services. And there's also a joint project with UC Press involving open access monographs with a print on demand component that the press uh, supports so that there's a combined uh, revenue model for, for, for print and open access of the digital versions. <clears throat> and we're probably going to see increasing collaborations with um, the UC Press in future. So this is just a screenshot of the interface which has been recently redesigned just to show you that it, it looks pretty robust and, and, and um, credible. It's, um, uh, r really nicely designed system. So how does the cost for publishing through that mechanism compare with some of the more traditional um, publishing costs? And much of, much of my data here comes from a 2009 report by Mark Ware Consulting uh, for, at the STM organization, which in turn cites a lot of other work. So it's a very useful um, report to um, take a look at that aggregates a lot of what is known in, or, 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 or asserted about the industry. And so um, one of the, one of the uh, data points in that, uh, that Mark Ware um, pulls out is um, that the cost of publishing uh, subs uh, articles in a subscription journal, on, the average cost is $3,800. Um, there was another uh, study by the Research Information Network in the UK that um, had uh, 2,800 uh, pounds um, as that, as that number for a per article cost. Um, I think uh, some of these numbers obviously need to be followed up and, and, qu and questioned. Um, that's quite different from 10,000 per article, but that's, uh, this is an average and not um, an individual journal that is a high, high re with a high rejection rate. Um, you can see the components that go into that cost, first copy costs, uh, managing the peer review and process, but also copy editing, typesetting. This is again how this particular study broke out these costs. Um, variable cost for printing or for, uh, for, uh, print distribution, um, you know, in an electronic realm, maybe you can knock those costs out. Um, indirect cost for staffing and overheads, and, and that's something that will vary depending on the organization, the type of organization. And then surplus, which would be um, profit, or in the case of a nonprofit, um, a nonprofit surplus that that supports the organization. And you can see the percentages there. I, about 40 percent, I think, is in first copy costs, and the rest is um, pretty much 2020-20. So um, if you look at our e-scholarship service, um, our, um, at the rate that we're currently ingesting content, and this, this, is not, this is not necessarily journal content, this is also our working papers, conference proceedings, um, uh, the cost per unit is $475. So that's a very basic calculation that's based on our cost to run and manage the repository and the amount of content that we're taking in every year. Um, as that content increases, um, certainly our cost would grow, but not um, this, uh, on a, the, the unit cost would, would decline over time. And you can see that in the archive um, repository, where, uh, which ingests uh, about 58,000 articles per year. The annual cost for running the repository now is about $360,000, um, plan to go a little higher in the next couple of years. Um, so the unit cost for ingesting content there is $6.20. Um, Again, these are, you know, there, there's a little bit of apples uh, to oranges um, comparison here, perhaps. Um, eScholarship is a publishing platform, so it has some publishing services and back-end uh, services for editorial management and so forth. Archive does not have that. Um, but even in eScholarship, um, although our platform is supporting um, the, ha the software that manages peer review, the actual activities involved in peer review and peer review management and editing are handled by the editor, the, the group that's publishing that content, whether it's a journal or um, uh, working papers or, or conference proceedings from one of our research units. So those costs are completely outsourced, stay with the, the author.
So if we look at all these things together, um, just looking at some baseline data, we think UC publishes about 41,000 uh, articles per year. Actually, that's a very squishy number, so it could be, it could be lower, but um, that's one number that, that's been pulled out. Um, our system-wide journal licensing costs, about $27 million per year. Um, that excludes campus-only subscriptions, so maybe add something to that. Maybe our total system, uh, system cost is in the $50 million range. If we were supporting um, direct open access through article processing fees at 3,000 per article, it would be $123 million. So that doesn't look like a good uh, deal for us. Um, at $1,500 per article, $61 million, um, that's getting a little bit closer. At the level of an institution's repository that really has very uh, minimal costs, um, that's when we start to get below the cost that we're, uh, th that we're uh, spending now, or the, the, the fees that we're uh, spending now. Um, if, if some of that uh, revenue is, is um, supplied by research grants, then that begins to offset those charges and the um, article processing fees, um, if the library is paying for some part of that, um, start to look uh, a little bit better. So um, next steps for UC, so this is, this, is a, this is kind of a sobering picture of the, the implications for a large research intensive institution of supporting article processing fees as one route to open access. And it tells us that we have a lot, really have a lot more work to do. Um, so we're going to be conducting a detailed assessment of our Springer pilot, including author uptake and some usage data, some of the cost implications. Um, we are interested in additional pilots with other publishers. We're just very interested in exploring and pushing on all of these uh, directions. Um, and we're going to be doing more analysis and more financial modeling to help us, help us understand what the next steps are. Thank you. Our final speaker is Ms. Gerner, and then we'll open the floor up for questions. So start thinking of questions now. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. I will complement the picture um, by describing the points of view of a very big publisher. Springer has been very early involved in the open access debate. Uh, since 2004, we have experimented with various business models, and by now we have quite a diverse ecosystem of open access business models around. I'm responsible for them as Springer's manager open access, and I would like to walk you through them and then focus um, especially on the institutional open access experiments. Okay, um, two slides on Springer, just so uh, you know how big we actually are. We publish 1,800 journals, uh, which result in 150,000 articles. Ivy just mentioned it's 1.4 million articles uh, in total in annual output in science, so it's a tenth of this. We further publish 6,500 books per year, and 22% of the Nobel laureates in the world publish with Springer. <laughs> That's a number we are very proud of. Um, we are a very global company, 60 publishing houses, 20 countries, 5,000 employees. This should give you a good picture, and I'll stop the corporate... Uh, <laughs> advertising now. So as I said, Springer and Open Access is um, uh, a long story already. 2004, we pioneered open choice. You have heard this term used quite a lot. I go into it in a little more detail. But let me walk through the different Open Access flavors at Springer. And you can group them in three pillars, which is author rights, hybrid open access, and fully open access. Let's start with the first, author rights. What do we allow the scientist to do with his article? Uh, you might know Sherpa Romeo, which is the central research that classifies the policies of publishers when it comes to um, author's rights. We are grouped as a green publisher. This is as good as it can get uh, in this classification. What does that mean? That means we allow uh, our authors to self-archive your article, being the uh, final author's version, not the Springer PDF, at your institutional repository or your own website, without an embargo, immediately. If you would like to put it into your funders repository, let's say PubMed Central, we ask for an embargo of 12 months, but we do assist you in doing it. So we will be happy to deposit your uh, final author's version of your published article into PubMed Central and make it available after 12 months. This is the green route. Um, 
Mike has introduced us to green versus gold. Uh, obviously, publishers are more interested in the gold route, and you see all the other models I described now um, have to do with open access journals or journals that offer the open access option. So the first is um, hybrid open access. Journals that um, traditionally are subscription journals and they charge subscriptions and content is behind access barriers, but we do offer the option to make your article open access against payment of a fee. And when we do this, uh, we at least do it right. So we don't just open it, which is free access, but we um, publish the article under a Creative Commons attribution on commercial license, which allows uh, free reuse and distribution for non-commercial purposes. Copyright stays with the author. This is fully in line with the official Berlin Declaration, Budapest Declaration, where science funders have um, defined what open access should look like. Uh, the new Springer link has just uh, been rebuilt and you can see that you can now filter for open access articles. So each open access article is clearly marked as such and um, allows a nice visibility of the open access output at Springer link. This is still pretty new. Each article is marked as open access. So we are fully transparent about the open access article output um, in total and per journal, per discipline. I'll show you a few numbers in a little while. So I just said, the open access option is available in the majority of Springer titles. There are some journals where we don't publish them ourselves, but we only hold distribution rights there. We obviously don't have it in place. And sometimes some society partners uh, are hesitant of offering the open choice option to the journals. But you can definitely say the default model for a Springer journal is the hybrid open choice option. If an author wants to pay us for making his article open access, the fee is 2,000 euro, 3,000 US dollar. If the, your institution has an experimental agreement with us, such as uh, University of California, the fees are taken care of centrally and you don't have to pay. And I'll uh, focus on this in a little while, but let me quickly mention our fully open access offering. Um, people sometimes don't know that Springer already pu publishes a proud number of 12 fully open access journals. Um, again, they are displayed at the newly Springer link. You can go right to them. It's 11 titles there. One just started this year and is still um, working on putting the first issue out. What's interesting now is uh, how are the business models for this, uh, these journals, you might wonder. Currently, none of them charges authors because the majority of them has a sponsor for these journals. So if associated societies or institutions take on the cost. So they, they pay the article processing charge to Springer on behalf of the authors. So to just recap, the, the models I just um, mentioned, because we are talking about business models, and I mean our goal is to identify the best business model, is not only the distinction between hybrid and fully open access. I mean, this is clear. What's more interesting is the question, which is the right business model, right? And I just mentioned three. I said, we, charge, we can charge authors, being it hybrid or in fully. We have institutional arrangements where one institution takes care of only their authors, but for all journals. And then we have journal-specific arrangements where one sponsor takes care of all potential authors in the world, but just for this particular journal. And if you have any insights, which of the three options is um, the best suited for the long-term development of Gold Open Access, I'd be very interested uh, to hear your opinion. Um, when we talk about fully open access, um, Biomed Central was mentioned earlier. They are a very strong publisher in biomedical, life science, and medical uh, areas. They publish currently 200 journals. We acquired them in 2008, which gave quite a buzz in the community. Uh, some people were scared, but I can reassure you, um, we will not touch this. Uh, 
we don't have any plans of integrating or converting or whatever. Um, this is a clear, clear um, statement on uh, that we think this business model is very interesting. And as Peter Zuber stated nicely in October 2008, we now consider ourselves even as the biggest open access publisher. Just to talk about their business model, they um, charge author fees and they're very strong in the membership model. Um, they have two memberships. Either the institution pays the full article fees and the author doesn't have to um, pay any fee all, at all, or um, they pay a little amount and the fees for the authors are uh, discounted, I think, by 25%. Yeah? So again, here it's the institutional approach, one institution taking care of its authors in this group of journals, or the author pays by himself. Um, this summarizes the three pillars I wanted to uh, introduce to you. And now let's look at, at our open access uptake across disciplines. Um, the left column shows you the distribution of our articles across disciplines. You can see we're very strong in medicine, biomedical, life science fields. And maybe these fields are generally stronger in science at all, in total, of course. And if you look at the open access articles uh, distribution across disciplines, the, the um, pattern looks pretty similar. Why is that? Well, definitely one of the reasons is that our open access articles, um, two-thirds, come from institutional arrangements. So for two-thirds of our articles, this payment barrier is solved, right? The author does not have to ask himself, do I really want open access? Uh, but I can't really pay or I don't want to go through the hassle of getting reimbursed for the fees. Um, so if we remove the uh, payment barrier, we see this pattern reflecting the general publication pattern. You also notice that the uptake is particularly strong in biomedical and life sciences area and medicine. I think this is obvious. These areas are having the longest history in open access with funding, with mandates and simply the familiarity um, with open access is stronger in this field. Now I mentioned um, that two-thirds of our articles come from institutional arrangements, so let's talk a little bit about it. Uh, two slides on how it works, and Ivy uh, has just shown screenshots which I'll update in a second. We started with this institutional arrangements already in late 2007 with the relatively small German University Göttingen and that was soon followed by arrangements with um, the UKB, the Dutch consortium of 13 universities, was followed by Max Planck, uh, which we believe, if, or I believe 25 institutes all over Germany and uh, Europe. Um, relatively recent, the um, UCL has joined and a very new deal is the University of Hong Kong deal. Um, as Ivy mentioned earlier, the Max Planck arrangement has just ceased two weeks after we started a new experiment with Hong Kong, and I'll talk about it in a second. Um, Ivy mentioned that in our um, accept, upon acceptance, the affiliation with the author is um, great. Ivy, you see this um, is redesigned, and I try to um, communicate better to authors what it means to publish open access. So I think the uptake will grow. We will see, you know, higher numbers than 60%. Uh, one thing I want to mention, although it might be clear, this is upon acceptance, right? So the and the same holds true for open choice payment of of 2,000 euro. Uh, the question of does the author pay is completely separated from do we want his manuscript published in our journal, right? This Chinese wall between the, the um, acceptance decision to, to increase the quality of the journal is completely separated by the eventually associated revenue through open access fees or through institutional arrangements. Now let's talk a little more about, um, sorry, Let's talk a little more about um, these pilots. What have we learned from them? They were very helpful to increase our number of open access articles, which is a good thing uh, if you want to you know, become familiar with what does it mean to publish open access articles, 
what do authors, what questions come up, where do we have to fix our back end, um, how do we communicate this properly. We have not seen uh, increased, uh, increased submissions or publications from any of the experiment partners, right? So Ivy has shown one quote where an author said, uh, this will affect my journal choice. This is something you might want to hope for, but we have not seen this happening. And you can say you are not surprised because we all know that the number one uh, factor to influence an author's journal choice is the journal's impact, right? So we definitely um, see this as well. The open access option where the fees are taken care of by the institution do not increase the uh, published articles output from this institution. The second thing we uh, looked at in detail is usage. How does usage develop or differ for open access articles from, from tall access articles? And there um, we see something very interesting. 15 to 20 percent, uh, or let, let me start again, open access articles see additional usage from public users so users who are not affiliated with an institution who has a license with us of 15 to 20 percent. Now what does that mean? Every article at Springerlink has a certain amount of public usage because sometimes we make articles freely available for promotional reasons. If you just consider this a baseline and you think now what on top is public usage by, by readers who otherwise would not have access, we see a significant effect of 15 to 20 percent. We have to keep in mind, however, that a lot of it will probably be coming from uh, robots and crawlers who just try every article there is on Springerlink and other publishers platform and if it's freely available, or I should say openly available, um, they just download it. Yeah? Um, our market research uh, people estimate that 75% of this public usage is actually artificial, so by crawlers and robots. Um, this is, of course, difficult to measure, but I wanted to share with you, we definitely see an increased um, public usage. So the public seems to make use of open access articles. Um, talking a little more about um, the business model of this experiment, it is very appealing to say to an institution, um, you pay us 100 dollars right now for your license deal and of course we just substitute this hundred you have you know no open access arrangement with us and you pay 100 dollar for subscriptions and we just substitute it slowly against open access right so you pay 20 now for open access and you pay only 80 of it for subscription in total it stays the same but you have prepaid your open access component looks very appealing However, it works only under two uh, conditions. One is that all customers do this at the same time. And the second is people publish as much as they read. The second aspect is clear, right? I mean, Ivy mentioned it uh, earlier today. People publish less than they read. And the pattern is also different, right? Especially corporates uh, read a lot, publish little. So this is definitely a fundamental question mark to the open ex gold open access idea. But let's talk about the other aspect which I mentioned. If we, if we now say to you, you know, you keep the level at 100, 20% is for open access, only 80% is for the license, then let's keep in mind that for this 20% of open access articles, we can't sell them to anybody else, right? So we are actually, I mean, this is a strong disadvantage as long as we see it as long as the transition takes place and we don't have a switch overnight. So there is a certain risk, or you could say disadvantage, to publishers going into this transition. As Stuart Schieber, you mentioned Stuart Schieber says, um, yeah, there needs to be a certain support for publishers to step into this transition. And we believe that as long as the transition takes place, we need to ask for extra payment of those who dare to pioneer open access to compensate for the losses uh, that we make at other spots. Um, it is an important learning and we'll see how, how we move forward. The Hong Kong University 
deal now does pay in addition to its license because they recognize exactly this dilemma, um, both the, the institution as well as the publisher is in. Um, Max, Max Planck um, sees it a little different, so there we had long ongoing discussions um, about this model and in the end they decided to not prolong the contract. However, it has been a friendly departure, I can reassure you, and we are um, still talking about uh, other potential business models with them. This is what I wanted to say about our institutional open access um, experiments, and I would like to quickly mention one further involvement of Springer. Um, we are looking after the best business model when it comes to open access as much as funders do, as libraries do, as scientists do. And uh, one project we are in, it's, a, it's called Study of Open Access Publishing, nice, nicely shortened to SOAP project, a name everybody remembers. It's a European Com Union funded project, two years, and the beauty of it is that we have all different stakeholders present. So it's not only publishers, but it's um, funders and scientific institutes. So we are in it together with Max Planck. Uh, it's led by the CERN, the um, High Energy Physics Institute in Geneva, which is um, also working on the, or um, leading the Scope 3 initiative. There are some other publishers and funders in it. What the study has done so far is go through the 4,700 journals in the directory of open access journals to assess their business model. And we are right now in the final phase of writing up the uh, first report that will definitely shed some light at which business models are prevalent right now. And uh, the second part is now a huge survey across scientists to gather evidence on attitudes, knowledge and experiences with open access publishing. And we'll disseminate the results of the both the analysis of the DOAJ journals as well as the survey at the project website. Okay, um, thank you very much. This is our new uh, Springer.com open access website. You'll clearly see it even has a section on authors' rights. So we are trying to be transparent and um, want to work together with all stakeholders involved. Thank you very much. So the speakers will come up to the front now, please. <laughs> and anyone who has a question, please come up to the microphone to ask your question since we're videotaping today's event for posterity. Can I start with a question? Oh, please do, yes. So I'm going to challenge Bettina on your 80%, 20% argument because you're still charging the same amount for the 80%. If you have 20% of your, of your journal is open access, you know, that, that's fine. People are still paying the same amount for that 80%. It's not. We are looking into... Is this on? Yeah. Um, well, this is a double dipping story, right? Yeah. yeah. I enjoyed the movie as much <laughs> as you did. Um, we are looking into price adjustments for, for the hybrid journals in general, right? I mean, this holds true as for institutional arrangements or individual authors paying open access fees to make the article uh, open access. You will have to understand that there's always a certain delay in adjusting prices for journals um, with respect to pioneering these experiments, right? So I said we started in late 2007 and you need to monitor the uptake and you also need to monitor the fluctuations you expect. And then you can uh, assess the uptake and make the next steps and adjust pricing. We have done this uh, for 2010 prices already for a small number of journals and I can reassure you uh, we will do that for a bigger number of journals in the next year because we see open access uptake grow in our journals. Bettina, would Springer publish that information or disclose it and make it available so that one could transparently see? Yeah, I know. I mean, we have this discussion internally a lot. Of course, we want to be transparent. On the other side, we have all these competitors up our back. Um, so this is not decided yet. It is very tricky. It is definitely, you know, confidential business information, which we ideally could share with some and not with others. 
But if this doesn't work, we are very careful. Okay. Questions for Ivy. Um, you mentioned in your presentation that on scope three, you currently have at least a verbal commitment or a promise of, of funding that equates to roughly 70% of the target. How is that calculated? What is the, how was the target calculated and how do you figure that you have 70% commitment at this point in time? Well, scope 3 was launched by a, a working party that came together to develop the ideas behind the initiative and CERN has certainly led that but there were others as well that were part of that in the UK and so forth. And their analysis was based on an analysis of the worldwide um, high, um, high energy physics publishing, how many articles are published in which countries and um, in which journals and um, assigning uh, a, a, a presumed dollar value which I don't can't recall how that how that calculation was done, but it was based on an assessment of the publishing output and what that likely meant about the, the need to support that publishing. So, you know, if you take a per article cost and multiply it by what is known about the size of that publishing sphere, that's essentially, um, you know, probably a simplified way of, of, of representing that. Okay, thank you. Hi, a question uh, about the Springer suggestion of um, an extra increment of readership uh, of the open access articles. Um, could you go into some details about how you actually studied and came to that conclusion? Uh, the reason I'm asking is uh, are you examining logs and just what can you be certain of? Uh, I mean, I heard you st state that you had, what, 15 to 20 percent more readers who otherwise would not have encountered those, those papers. Is that correct? I have not compared absolute usage between total access and open access articles. No, I realize that. Right? I'm sure I realize that. I, I, yeah. Um, well, what we did is, and that was also triggered by questions from Ivy, uh, we, we chose a subset of um, open access articles, both from institutional arrangements, so there were UC authored articles, as well as uh, another group of open choice articles. And um, with our usage analysis tools internally, we can, of course, you know, see how much usage is attributed <coughs> to use it to readers who have licensed this content versus how much comes from an unlicensed user. The IPs, right? Exactly. But what you really, uh, sorry if I'm sounding dense here, but how do you, how can you come to a conclusion that the user, say, is just coming from their home and doesn't want to turn on their browser setting, you know? I fully agree, that's definitely a limitation. Thanks. Hi, I'm very interested in uh, learning how do you um, solve the footnotes that are uh, reflected only in electronic databases or in electronic uh, resources. For example, are you interested in creating mirror sites or archiving in any way documents that are referenced in footnotes through their URL? So far I haven't seen anything like that. Do you think that that will help you, that will give you um, an advantage over your competition because no one has thought about doing that. Mm -hmm. I'm coming from law where footnotes represent more in terms of scholarship than the content okay. of the article. Yeah. I'm coming from molecular biology, so this is new <laughs> to me. But I take it home and uh, discuss it with our editorial. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So I'm uh, a publisher too from Columbia University Press, from the hood and misunderstood, I like to say. Um, <clears throat> Bettina, you're a brave person, actually, to come and, and present this. I wanted to ask <laughs> Michael a question um, about first copy costs, because uh, it's something we all think about and talk about. And uh, there's obviously a huge disparity between what we heard from the California Digital Library and what's going on at, at uh, Rockefeller. And I, I know from my experience running a university press, a monograph publisher, not a journal publisher, 
that the cost of peer review, uh, which has to be reflected in, in uh, first copy costs, for book publishing is even higher than it is for journals, or at least that's my sense from what I knew at Hopkins when I was there, what I'm learning here. Um, and getting at some kind of an understanding, really, of how one calculates that. So you could look at it across different kinds of programs and really think about what the costs are to the system is, is a real challenge. So I would ask you, if I could, and I don't mean to ask for proprietary information at all, but um, when you talk about uh, the costs that, it, it, that you incur to publish every article, um, I've heard a report from NAS, National Academy of Science, about their open access publishing. I asked the same questions about them. That's an institution that is quasi-government, is heavily supported through funding from an act of Congress, significant budget uh, put forward just to help them publish. Uh, everything that they publish is subsidized. You know, it's the, really the question of whether those costs reflect any subsidy that you receive from, from Rockefeller. Uh, you know, whether it's uh, space, uh, you know, uh, benefit costs, uh, any of the things that go into running a publishing organization, and if they don't, you know, what are the actual first copy costs? Which, you know, I'm, again, I'm not asking you anything proprietary. No, not at all. Yeah. So we don't think about first copy costs in those terms anymore because printing and distribution is such a, such a small part of our budget. Printing and distribution is only about 10% of our budget now. Um, so we think about overall expenses. Um, we receive no subsidy from the university. We pay rent on uh, space outside the university because the university doesn't have space for us. Um, and any surplus that we have at the end of the year goes back in to the university. We are actually expected to turn a surplus into the university at the end of the year. The university, of course, as an organization, is nonprofit. So all your costs really are derived from your ability to sell subscriptions. Absolutely. Yeah, good for you. <laughs> That's impressive. A, a question for Mike. Um, when we um, talk to faculty about open access publishing, one of the um, concerns we hear and um, we think um, to some extent misunderstandings that we hear are that uh, open access journals are not the same quality as peer reviewed. Now in some cases that's certainly true, but in other cases like PLOS it's not. Um, your description of a sort of track to go with archival and um, se selective publications would seem to sort of reinforce that in a very significant way. So you really would have an environment where open access was a much lower quality journal. It, it doesn't have to be. So that slide with all the subsidies, how can you subsidize a selective open access journal? I think you can publish a selective open access journal. I think. Uh, unless you're going to charge $10,000 per article to the authors, you have to subsidize that in some way. Um, let me see if I can find the quote that I have. So the issue of lower stringency peer review being associated with open access is long-standing. Let's see if I can find it. Yeah. Um, the first major open access publisher in, in biomedical was Biomed Central. And they codified this <coughs> lower stringency peer review at their inception. Um, this is from uh, a, a news item in Nature 10 years ago when Biomed Central was just getting going. And it was quoting from a Biomed Central official who noted that reviewers will assess scientific accuracy, not interest. So by interest, I mean, I interpret that to mean whether it's an advance for the field. Hmm. So that. Was, was codified 10 years ago. And uh, part, my understanding, Rebecca might be able to help me, and my understanding is part of the origin of PLOS was to try to counter that codification by Biomed Central that said open access publishing is going to be low quality papers. And the PLOS guys, you know, you've got people like Harold and my guys and then Pat Brown, pretty serious scientists, distinguished scientists, said, no, we can do it. Uh, uh, publish a high quality journal, we can do it open access, um, and that's what they set out to do. As it turns out, my understanding from those guys is that their costs are even higher. 
than ours to publish their, their flagship journals. And it turns out that they've had to turn to the subsidy route to continue publishing very high quality open access journals. There's no question that those are high quality journals, but they are subsidizing them with the, with the publication of an archival journal. Um, since Mike asked for some clarification, um, in the original business plan for PLOS, the archive journal was always in the business plan. The way that PLOS began, though, was at a very high level, in fact, to counteract, as, as Mike says, um, to counteract the, the impression that the only way you could do an open access journal would be at the archival level. Um, that said, the very original plan was always to do exactly what they're doing now with PLOS One. They just rolled it out in reverse order. So rather than starting archivally and then building up, they started with PLOS Biology and PLOS Medicine and then with the community journals and then with PLOS One. But they're executing 100% on the original business plan. Right. So their top-down model has been very successful. And it has been, but I believe that you're, you're also right that, and I don't know what the current costs are, but I think uh, way back when it was like $30,000 an article in biology and medicine. Yeah. Um, the, the other example is, is Biomed Central. So Biomed Central tried a bottom-up approach. Mm -hmm. uh, they, for many years, published dozens and dozens of archival journals and then said, we're going to publish a very selective journal, and that's the Journal of Biology, which has not been successful. Oh, I disagree. I mean, <laughs> uh, I, I agree they started with a uh, group of very specialized journals and then they got the submissions got of higher and higher quality and they decided to add top tier journals on top. Um, and there's also BMC Medicine and I think BM, BMC Medicine will certainly be a success story. They also have a malaria journal, which is much broader than the initial titles on tropical diseases. And then, I know that they rank, you know, together with PLOS neglected tropical diseases under the top three of their um, field. So I have to defend Biomed Central. Uh, so Ivy, I was struck by, uh, in your slide, you said there are 60% of faculty are participating in open access for your um, project with Springer. And that to me is fascinating that there's so many faculty. And you seem to think that was a low number. No, it's, it's not. I, I, and I don't know how I phrased it on the slide. Okay. It's that 60% of the articles that have been published by UC faculty in Springer journals have elected. 60% uh, of the articles. Uh, yeah. Well, that still seems like a high number to me. Well, it's supposed to be automatic, so it should be closer to 100%. And there should, you know, in theory, should be a very low percentage that spent intentionally decline that option if one assumes mm -hmm. that faculty desire open access, which is what our faculty library committee tells us. So one would then expect the only, you know, the only authors who would decline that option would be those who maybe have a, you know, a patent concern or some, some, some concern that lead, or some philosophical stance that leads them to nice. not select that option. So I think the fact that it's only 60 percent, um, you know, again, we're going to do some surveying of faculty to understand what's behind those figures, but my guess is it's just not as self-evident to the corresponding author as it might otherwise be. Right, because when I think of open access, I think of um, faculty, and if faculty aren't in, interested in open access, then how do we get them interested? Because when you think about Springer, they have to maximize profits, and open access is a public good, so how do we put the two together, and I think a sustainable business model would be one where faculty are more involved, and I thought, oh, 60 percent at CDL, they've hit on faculty involvement, how, what are they doing that we're not doing, and, but you still may be doing well, something. I still well, think that's a high number. We're, we're paying the check is the big thing that we're right. doing. Right. <laughs> and, and we're making it easy. They don't have to modify their publishing agreements. They don't have to, you know, get beaten up over the, uh, about depositing their article in a repository. They just have to do what they normally do, which is submit their article to their journal of choice and be accepted. So we've made it easy for them, and the fact that we're writing the check is a big, you know, is a big plus. Mm -hmm. And let me add there, the 60% is the average um, value for 2009, right? We are currently at 80%. So we see this increase, which has to do with um, education, obviously, right? Has to do with the usability of the site, which has just been improved. So I'm positive we are moving closer to 100%. <laughs> yeah. Hi, I'm uh, Greg Millar from Rockefeller, and I'm the person who sells all the subscriptions so. <laughs> for the time being. 
Um, <laughs> uh, I'm interested in the notion of, uh, besides the sort of the moral argument of the author, that why they would be motivated to come up with the ten thousand dollars or fifteen or twenty um, to have their article just freely available to the public forever. Um, what is there an incentive in terms of uh, citations? Is there any evidence so far that that articles are being cited more that are open access? And I know that that's it's a tough baseline to get because I guess you'd have to look at articles that are similar or, or are in similar journals. Uh, I don't know exactly how that would be would be done, but um, I'm just curious as to. Um, and by the way, we just to add, we do we are open access in the sense that we offer the journals in an open access way to about 145 countries around the world. So we, there is a kind of subsidy there. And you talked about the concentration of there are more, far fewer authors than readers. But I think we also get to a really, it's very US centric, these arguments. At Rockefeller, about 60% of the subscription revenue comes from countries outside the US. So you know, the Chinese are subsidizing, uh, they're paying for for readership all over China when they're not necessarily contributing as many authors. Um, Brazil is, we have a large uh, countrywide deal with Brazil. So there's, there's a lot of international restructuring that would go on and a lot of it would come to big US research institutions obviously. But I think we, sometimes we lose sight of that international aspect of, of the subscription based model. Um, sorry, I had two things there conflated, <laughs> but I wanted to get that one in while I was at the mic. <laughs> sure. So my understanding, this is Phil Davis's area of study, talking about citations to open access content. That, that was the first question, right? OK. <laughs> uh, my understanding from Phil is that uh, he does not see an increase in citations to open access content, but he does see an increase in hits to open access content uh, on the websites. It's actually kind of early to study that. I think we all want to study that. But given we were just talking about citation half-lives earlier, um, you probably need a little bit more time to, although maybe it's beginning to be studyable at this point. So there have been conflicting studies, right? I think ISI published a, a study early on sort of citing an open access advantage, and then Phil Davis came along and sort of debunked that article. Or, um, so uh, uh, the jury's probably still out on, on that, but um, I'm sure it's something we all want to study, and I don't know, maybe Bettina has some results there. I'm following it, and I don't uh, see any um, solution to the bias um, problem we have, which is that authors might make their best article open access, right? And then you might, of course, see an increased citation, and you don't know, can you attribute it to the access aspect or to the quality aspect? Um, these are the things um, those scientists struggle with. I personally think Springer would be crazy to, to do the analysis because um, we don't have the scientific power you know, as much as those research groups who are working on it. And as far as the internationalization, I, mean, I think you're absolutely right. And that actually su supports the point that readership is much broader than authorship. And so that, that leads to a much wider distribution of revenue. And in negotiation, in ne typical negotiations with publishers, we often say, well, we're trying to keep our costs and our increases low, you know, go get your revenue growth in the developing world because that's where, where, you do, where there is a lot of growth. Um, and so I think that, you know, we sort of acknowledge that. And, um, yeah. uh, I think it was in Ivy's presentation, it was, and it was briefly touched on as the, uh, the other part of this perception problem for open access is the ISI impact factor and the academies, the broad academies need to have a tenure process validated by a peer reviewed publication. And I wondered if any one of the three of you would like to talk about that as a larger issue. I mean, Harold Varmus presented at the, uh, in November at the Association of American Medical Colleges made a plea to the academy, which is basically, you know, you, you're paying these prices because you actually set the model up. Um, and what are you going to do as administrators to change that model? So to change the model, meaning to change the tenure process, to stop relying on or reduce reliance on things or, like impact factor? Or, or to, or to um, make it a little bit more transparent about the ISI impact factor being a lagging indicator of the value of a journal or to what was mentioned just a couple of seconds ago about the fact that just because it's in a high impact journal doesn't necessarily mean it's high value research. 
And I, my sense is everyone recognizes those challenges, but there, no one has, has identified a subst substitute that, that in the tenure process, um, re review committees still need, want some sort of proxy. They're not going to read the articles and evaluate them on their merit. So they want some sort of proxy. And journal brand and impact is, is, is a proxy. And no one has, that I know of has come up with an alternative proxy that would be efficient. I mean, I tend to think that, that the system would change more rapidly if people wanted it to change, if those who write and those who are involved in the scholarly communication process and in tenure and all of this um, want it to change, they would find, find the, the right ways to do it. That, and I don't mean that folks don't want change, but that the, the mechanisms, the path isn't that, isn't that clear. It's not self-evident. But things can change very quickly if the, circum if the conditions are right. So you know, a lot of our experimentation is predicated on generating a lot of experimentation so that conditions can be disrupted and maybe the right conditions can emerge or we can, we can learn whether there are indeed the right conditions for some sort of transformation. But so I tend to think that if, if the right proxy, you know, if someone developed the right proxy, it could be very influential, but it just hasn't happened yet. So I don't think, as, as publishers, I don't think we are going to change that system. That's, that system has to happen within university administrations. Mm -hmm. As publishers, what we can do is try to provide a little more information besides having tenure committees just rely on, on a proprietary number provided by, by some corporation. Um, you know, the simplest thing to think of is usage stats. So we can, we can now provide usage stats. Uh, for individual articles. Now, how much weight is going to be given to usage stats depends on the tenure committees. But we're beginning to at least be able to provide something in, in addition to just the impact factor. Yeah, especially the limit, this um, drilling, drilling down to the article level, right? We see um, Claus as well as Biomed Central experimenting with article level metrics at their website. Now, how, how this is taken into account by decision makers it's unfortunately not up to publishers to influence. Are there any other questions? Okay, I, I guess we'll wrap up then. Um, thank you very much to our panelists today. You were great. And thank you very much to everyone for coming. And uh, we'll see you again at our next event. And there's handouts on the chairs, which has the next event on it. So please take a look at it. And I hope you all come out for the next, the next one as well. Thank you very much.